Anthony Bourdain was a chef, writer, and world traveler who charmed practically everyone he met in his remarkable life. But beneath the glamour, he was a complex and emotional person who felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. This is the tragic truth about Anthony Bourdain's life. By all accounts, Anthony Bourdain had a relatively normal American childhood, growing up in the 60s and 70s in suburban New Jersey. But Bourdain admitted that he never quite felt normal in this normal environment. He told NPR in 2017, I was an angry kid. For whatever reason, I was definitely a very angry, bitter, nihilistic, destructive, and self-destructive kid. Part of it stems from Bourdain's lifelong itch to get the most he possibly could out of life, be it good, bad, or ugly. He explained to The Guardian in 2013, I was rebellious and bitter that I wasn't old enough to be in San Francisco dropping acid. I had impeccable taste in rock and roll for a 10-year-old, yet was too young to live that life. It made me angry. Most of my friends had rich absentee parents or came from broken homes, so they were free to do whatever they wanted. I deeply resented the relative stability at my house. So he developed a stubborn, free-spirited streak that stayed with him into adulthood. When asked by Men's Journal what advice he would give his younger self, Bourdain responded, I wouldn't have listened. That's the kind of asshole I was. I would have gone right ahead and made the same mistakes. Anthony Bourdain's rise to culinary success and eventually global fame was anything but glamorous. He got his start in the food world back in the mid-70s, working through college as a dishwasher at a restaurant in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Bourdain quickly moved from the sink to the line, where he learned just how undeveloped his skill set was compared to the other cooks. But he was passionate, and he was hooked. So he dropped out of college and enrolled in the Culinary Institute of America. After graduating in 1978, Bourdain slogged through the culinary ranks of New York City restaurants, working long hours and spending late night after hours doing drugs and living a rock star lifestyle. Come on, put down the crack pipe and make your dessert. It took two decades before he was eventually named the executive chef at Brasserie Leal. The whole experience, the labor, the grind, the substance abuse was tough on him and made him tougher and meaner in turn. Bourdain told The Guardian in 2017 of the, quote, psychotic rage he felt during those years. He said he was awful to line cooks, abusive to waiters, and bullying to dishwashers, adding, I hurt, disappointed, and offended many, many, many people, and I regret a lot. While working in kitchens, Bourdain was simultaneously developing his passion for writing. It was this skill set that would eventually catapult Bourdain's career and change his life forever. While he may be one of the most well-known figures in the culinary world, Anthony Bourdain didn't become a celebrity until he was in his 40s. And up until that point, he lived without much of a sense of stability or security. When Bourdain first started out after culinary school, he was barely getting by. In a 2017 interview with Wealth Simple magazine, he recalled those days by saying, I never went home with more than 120 bucks. Not a lot of dough. I was staying with my then-girlfriend. I ate most of my meals at work. He was in a cycle of debt he couldn't get out of, and was always a paycheck behind. Kitchen Confidential, the book that launched Bourdain's career and changed his life, was published in 2000, when the chef was 44 years old. At that point in time, Bourdain admitted that he hadn't filed taxes in about 10 years, and was also behind on his rent. He'd never had health insurance or a savings account. As a result, Bourdain said that he spent every day trying to deal with the stress of financial precarity. He said, in my daily life, the goal was to muffle the anxiety that I'd feel as I tried to drift off to sleep knowing that, at any point, what little money I had in my bank account could be garnished by the IRS or the credit card company. The landlord could kick me to the curb. That was my reality for many years. Even after his success kicked off in earnest, Bourdain lived his life battling inner demons. He once called himself an unhappy soul in an interview with The Guardian. In the early 2000s, after his first marriage ended, he admitted in his book, Medium Raw, to being aimless and regularly suicidal. Eventually, he acknowledged that he was living with depression. Bourdain opened up about his struggles during an episode of Parts Unknown in 2016. While filming in Argentina, he spoke with a therapist about how even things which seemed insignificant could trigger major bouts of sorrow and despondency. Something as trivial as a bad hamburger at the airport, he said, had the potential to set him off, launching him into a prolonged spiral of depression. He also admitted to feeling alone. I feel kind of like a freak, and I feel very isolated. I communicate for a living, but I'm terrible at communicating with people I care about. 
In an interview with People just four months before his death, Bourdain confessed, There have been times, honestly, in my life that I figured, I've had a good run. Why not just do this stupid thing, this selfish thing? Jump off a cliff into water of indeterminate depth. While Anthony Bourdain spent his TV career shining the spotlight on other people's food and cultures, at the end of the day, he believed himself to be a narcissist. A reasonable person does not believe that you are so interesting that people will watch you on television. I think this is evidence of a narcissistic personality disorder. Despite this self-professed view of himself, Bourdain was also overwhelmed by his own fame. He told Business Insider in 2016, I work really hard to not ever think about my place in the world. I'm aware of my good fortune. I'm very aware of it. And I'm very aware that, because of it, people offer me things. Filmmaker Morgan Neville, who documented Bourdain's life story in the film Roadrunner, told Rolling Stone this sense of awareness was like an insecurity that always pushed Bourdain forward. He never slowed down working. It wasn't money. It was just Tony feeling like if he slowed down, something was going to catch up with him. In the wake of his death, family, friends, and co-workers are revealing more about the struggles they witnessed Anthony Bourdain deal with. For the most part, he suffered in silence and didn't do much to tackle his issues head-on. While filming his new documentary on Bourdain's life, filmmaker Morgan Neville learned of the chef's battles with a range of mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, agoraphobia, OCD, bipolar episodes, and an addictive personality. Speaking to Vanity Fair, Neville said, I think what drove his unhappiness was that he was somebody who had been running away from his deeper problems for a long time. Part of that is what made him interesting, great as a personality and compelling to watch, but part of it made him an incredibly vulnerable person. Bourdain had implied in the past that he maybe didn't deserve to confront his own unhappiness, saying he felt he wasn't going to get a lot of sympathy from people. I'm not going to get a lot of sympathy uh, from people, uh, frankly. I mean, I have the best job in the world, let's face it. Anthony Bourdain was a beloved figure to millions of people in the food industry and beyond. But within the tight circle of the culinary TV world, he also managed to make quite a few enemies. Mostly because Bourdain had a lot of strong opinions, and he had no hesitation in making them known, no matter how harsh. He's hit targets across the culinary spectrum with reckless abandon. From Wolfgang Puck to Rachel Ray to Paula Deen, whom he called, quote, the worst, most dangerous person to America. And then, of course, there was the years-long feud with Guy Fieri after Bourdain remarked to TV Guy that he looked like a Simpsons character. Perhaps Bourdain's most intense clash, though, was with the entire Food Network. After his first TV show, A Cook's Tour, saw relative success, Bourdain was ready to continue traveling the world and exploring out-of-the-box and unknown cuisines. However, the Food Network wanted him to crank out ratings by focusing on familiar domestic comforts like barbecue. So Bourdain walked away, made a deal with a travel channel, and soon after, no reservations was born. No one would disagree that Anthony Bourdain was the type of person to call things exactly as he saw them. It was something that many people admired, and it was also something that got him in hot water sometimes. Interview after interview can be found of him blasting off snarky comments about fellow celebrity chefs, the pitfalls of Western dining culture, politicians, and more. If Bourdain had something to say, the world was going to hear it. But those who knew him best experienced a whole other Anthony Bourdain, one that was reserved, a little goofy, extremely humble, and kind. Brasserie Leal owner Philippe Lajuni told GQ that he remembered Bourdain as being, quote, very quiet, almost timid. Close friend and fellow chef Eric Repair recalled that he never complained about anything. Speaking to Vanity Fair, many of the fixers who worked with Bourdain recalled how he respected and engaged them in ways not commonly seen in the industry. But perhaps chef and friend Gabrielle Hamilton summed it up best, telling GQ, Tony lavishes you with love and friendship and generosity and kindness. It was breathtaking to be loved by him. The culinary world and the millions of others who cherished Anthony Bourdain were brought to a standstill with the tragic news of his death on Friday, June 8, 2018. CNN reported that Bourdain was in France filming a new episode of Parts Unknown along with French chef Eric Repair when he died. It was Repair, a longtime close friend of Bourdain's, who found him unresponsive in his hotel room at the Le Chambard Hotel in Kaysersburg that morning. French authorities quickly ruled the 61-year-old's death a suicide. 
After his death, CNN and the show's production company, 0.0, decided not to air the episode Bourdain was working on at the time, set to showcase France's Alsace region. They did, however, decide to honor Bourdain's work and legacy by piecing together a final season of Parts Unknown. From the moment the news broke of Anthony Bourdain's death, his impact on the world became even more clear. Tributes came pouring in like a tidal wave from those who knew him, worked with him, briefly met him, or only ever saw him through their TV screens. Millions came together to mourn the loss of a great chef and an even greater teacher who demonstrated how to experience food, embrace its power to bridge divides, and use that power to better understand life and humanity. One thing is for sure, Anthony Bourdain will never be forgotten. Lydia Tenalia, the co-founder of ZPZ Productions, said after Bourdain's death that the work he started will carry on in his honor. She told GQ, Through all these years of working with him, through osmosis, we have the same creative force and integrity as that guy, and we're trying to move forward with it. Bourdain's brother, Christopher, told the Today Show that he hopes people learn from Bourdain's open-mindedness when interacting with unfamiliar people and places, and come to appreciate diversity in the wholehearted way he did. Filmmaker Morgan Neville, speaking with CBS News, described Bourdain as the advocate in our society for how we can treat people on the far side of the planet as dimensional people who have their own dreams and loves and families and hopes. That is the greatest achievement that he had. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255.